Hi, Andre here from the MSAG team. This video in our interview series covers an absolutely fundamental concept for your medical school interviews, the GMC duties of a doctor. Let's find out how being familiar with these can make your interview a lot easier. Timestamps in the description below. My name is Paul Grant, and in this video, I would like to talk to you about a topic which is fundamentally important to being a doctor. We're going to discuss the key duties of a doctor, what makes the job different from other professions, and why being a doctor is both a privilege and a lifelong vocation. This is a common topic for medical school interviews, so this video is about the importance of professionalism and accepting responsibility when caring for patients. The public needs to have confidence in doctors because of the important work that they do. Even though doctors are also human beings and as such make human mistakes, they have a clear duty and there is a public expectation for them to work at high standards at all times. The General Medical Council, or GMC, which is the professional regulator for doctors, has produced a clear outline of the criteria which all doctors in the UK should be striving towards. These guidelines or criteria are known as good medical practice duties of a doctor and are vital for you to understand and to be able to discuss knowledgeably. In the next 10 minutes, I will help you gain a firm understanding of the GMC duties of a doctor and the four domains that they fall under using some real world examples. We will highlight some scenarios that commonly come up in medical school interviews and explain how you can implement your knowledge and understanding of the duties of a doctor to be able to discuss these issues thoughtfully. So, first, let's focus on understanding the duties of a doctor. A duty means a responsibility or obligation to behave in a certain way. Back in 2013, the GMC published a comprehensive document entitled Good Medical Practice. The purpose of this document was to define the duties of a doctor with the ultimate goal of protecting patients and to improve the practice of medicine. Much of this was informed by the findings of the infamous Harold Shipman case. How many of you heard about the Harold Shipman case? If this is new to you, I would thoroughly recommend pausing the video here and doing a quick bit of research about this important topic. So, what's in this special document produced by the GMC? Well, good medical practice outlines what is expected of doctors practicing in the UK and is essentially a behavioral commitment and a modern form of the Hippocratic Oath. Doctors regularly have to prove that they work within these guidelines through the processes of appraisal and revalidation. For example, keeping up to date with the latest techniques and research in their speciality by attending training courses or conferences is really important, often known as continuing professional development. To show that I am a trustworthy, honest and reliable doctor, I ask for GPs, patients, teammates, managers and colleagues to give me structured feedback on my performance. Now anyone can complain to the GMC about a doctor's performance and if they are found to have fallen below the required standards they will likely find themselves investigated by the GMC with regards to their fitness to practice and in severe cases they may lose their license to practice medicine. This is to protect patients from very bad doctors and to maintain public confidence in the medical profession. Now that we've spoken about some of the duties of a doctor, let's talk about the four domains of good medical practice. The four domains are, number one, knowledge, skills, and performance. Number two, maintaining trust. Number three, safety and quality. Four, communication, partnership, and teamwork. Being able to signpost your recognition that a scenario falls under any of the domains above is key. Now, if we look at each of these domains in turn, then we can consider real-world examples of when a doctor may or may not have stuck by those guidelines and risked failing in their duties. Firstly, knowledge and skills are central to the practice of medicine. Doctors need to keep up to date and on top of the latest developments through keeping up with the medical literature. Discussion of the latest evidence with colleagues or researchers and attending courses. Continuing professional medical education is lifelong and coupled with experience helps to keep doctors performing effectively. Now, on the other hand, a poorly performing doctor may be the one that does not engage with the latest in evidence-based medicine and does not change their practice even when there is a good reason to do so. As technology and research evolves, it's easy to believe that much of what you learn at medical school will become outdated during your time working as a doctor. 
So, over the course of a long career, it is vital to stay up to date with the safest and optimal treatment options. This is called evidence-based medicine. Secondly, safety and quality are paramount. It invokes the Latin phrase primum non nascere, first do no harm, which is an ethical pillar that you will hear about in more detail in the videos of our ethics series. By always using protocols or guidelines, as well as auditing our performance against standards of care, doctors are able to demonstrate that they provide high quality and safe clinical care. Examples of this in action would be surgical doctors looking at the survival rates of their patients who have undergone heart bypass surgery, for example. If things have gone wrong, then learning from medical errors or critical incidents is essential. The process of learning from our errors is a technique that we have picked up from the airline industry, where errors are meticulously studied with the aim of preventing them ever happening again. From spending time doing work experience or even watching documentaries about doctors and hospitals, you can appreciate that medicine is a highly complex field. When things do go wrong, such as the wrong patient being the wrong medication, it's important to look at systems and processes to understand how to avoid such things happening again, thus moving away from a traditional culture of blame. Can you think about a time during your work experience or your personal life where you saw a mistake being made? How did you or the team handle this error? This is a common topic, so it's worth considering and preparing some examples that you're able to say something from your own experience. As Peter Parker's uncle says, with great power comes great responsibility. If patients are unable to trust or rely on their doctors, then this can cause a breakdown in the doctor-patient relationship. Doctors are of course human and fallible, but can make errors of judgment, so it's important that damaged trust is rebuilt. When it comes to, for example, maintaining patient confidentiality or communicating with colleagues, trust is vital to maintain the best patient support and confidence. Can you think of an example of when you have observed patient confidentiality being broken during your work experience? It is important to realise that patient confidentiality can be broken very easily in clinical practice. Imagine walking into a busy A&E department. Have you ever been able to hear what's going on behind the thin curtains where your patients are being seen? I'm sure your answer is probably yes. After all, we know that those curtains aren't soundproof. Doctors should always try to maintain trust and confidentiality with patients, and though this is not always possible, we should make every effort to make sure it occurs in the majority of cases. Finally, we move on to communication. Communication is one of the cornerstones of maintaining good clinical practice. Remember, as doctors, we communicate with our patients as well as our colleagues to ensure optimal care for patients. This is frequently one of the biggest areas in which doctors fall down. Communication failures, not clinical errors, are actually one of the biggest sources of complaints against doctors. There is now a huge emphasis on communication skills training in UK medical schools, and ultimately, the best doctors tend to be the best communicators, rather than the most technically proficient. Can you think of an example of a time when you have seen good communication skills being put into practice during your work experience? As a doctor, if you were to fail to properly explain to someone the potential side effects of starting a new medication or the downsides of undergoing a complicated operation, then you would fail in your duty to your patient. You must use your communication skills to provide informed consent to do these things in medicine. Taking the time to relay information effectively to patients and colleagues is vital in modern medicine and aids good practice. This is supported by recognition of the fact that working in multidisciplinary teams leads to better outcomes and greater colleague and patient satisfaction. Are you aware of what I mean by the term multidisciplinary team? If you aren't, then I would recommend taking the opportunity here to do some more research on the term and why it's relevant to a healthcare setting. So, how might you be tested on the duties of a doctor? There are many areas in which the duties of a doctor are relevant and bear consideration. Consider the example of a colleague who comes into work smelling of alcohol. Let's say that the scenario noted that you were the first person to pick up your colleague was not in a fit state to work. Which domains would you need to consider in this scenario? Well, the most obvious domain would be maintaining patient safety, as the doctor could put patients in harm's way if he or she was intoxicated. Consider how the domain of communication, which is equally as important. You would need to discuss how you would need to take the colleague aside privately, what you would say to them, to discuss why he had come into work intoxicated, and whether you would need to raise this to a senior or not. 
Remember, it is important to use a good structure in any answer. Now, try and think about the domains which the following two examples would fall under. How would you respond to a patient that makes a complaint against you because you did not warn her about the risks of liver damage when taking paracetamol? How would you approach a scenario in which you have found a nurse taking medications from the drug cupboard and they are requesting you not to tell anyone? The first skill you need to be able to develop is to identify which of the domains of good medical practice might be compromised in each scenario and then be able to logically discuss how you address these types of problems in medical school interviews. I hope that this video has helped to show you that all of these domains are all very important in the maintenance of standards in the medical profession. Can you see how one domain is no more important than one another? They all overlap with each other. Doctors are human and at the end of the day can make mistakes. But it's important to recognise how those mistakes might have an impact on patient safety, trust, the understanding of the general public and errors in busy systems so that we can prevent these from happening again in the future. At this stage, I would recommend that you have a look at the website of the British Medical Journal and the Medical Practitioners Tribunal Service to get an idea of recent cases where doctors have made mistakes and how the GMC have responded to these issues and held them to account. Ultimately, these duties have been set out by the GMC to keep patients protected from harm and to provide them with good care. They are also the standards against which doctors will be judged against if they ever have to go through fitness to practice proceedings. It makes sense, therefore, to bear these duties in mind as it is what we owe to each other as moral beings. In this video, we have defined the term duties of a doctor, explained the key elements in detail, and finally given you some examples of how you could be tested on your knowledge of the duties of a doctor in discussions. Well done. You have now come to the end of this video. I hope it has been helpful and you feel more confident in approaching these types of questions in your medical school interviews. Good luck. Hello again, and thanks for watching. Now that you're familiar with the duties of a doctor, we hope that you use them frequently when answering your interview questions. If you need help with relating the duties of a doctor to a specific question or example, let us know in the comment section below. If you found this video helpful, please leave a like, and if you want to see more medical school admissions content, then subscribe to our channel. We put out new videos every week. Best of luck on your admissions.